We've been uh, privileged at Spring to, to know Bruce for a, a number of years and certainly appreciate his uh, dedication to the Lord and his preaching of the gospel. He's been doing that for quite some time. I guess it started back in the 80s. And he's uh, a graduate of Southwest uh, School of uh, Bible Studies and also Memphis School of Preaching. And we still have him here. It says something about his capabilities, I think. He is uh, preaching for the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation in Huntsville. Uh, been there since 19, uh, 2001. He serves as one of the elders, too, and I think at least one of the elders here, uh, Weldon Blake. He's done mission work in the Philippines, Cambodia, and he holds uh, numerous gospel meetings and speaks on lectureships. And that's why he's here, because he's speaking on a lectureship. And he also serves as the, uh, he, he served on various uh, Bible camps as a director, but he also currently sa uh, serves as the director of the Lone Star Bible Camp, which is a combined effort of uh, both the Fisher Hatchery Road and Spring. So uh, we recognize his capabilities there, and, and uh, both congregations are putting that to good use. And he also serves as an instructor for uh, Truth Bible Institute. And he also fixes potholes. <laughs> he works for the Texas Department of Transportation. And that is, I don't guess that means you get to drive a truck or anything, do you? Or you just, you, he just he's fix, fixes potholes. So if you're driving up and down the road there and you see a pothole, you got his number, you give him a call, and he'll, he'll, take, <laughs> he'll take care of that. But uh, what we want him to do now is to, to <laughs> fix another pothole. <laughs> that's, that's the one of pride. Uh, Christ confronted pride. And I think you find his comments uh, very incisive and compelling. And so Bruce, come speak to us. He told me how much time I have in Spanish, but since I don't speak Spanish, I'll just go till I get done. I got the guy here. <laughs> You're not supposed to speak in tongues unless there's a translator, but that's another lesson. I'm very proud to be here today. No. <laughs> I'm proud of these elders, proud of this congregation. No. <laughs> There's a lot of things, you know, we use the word pride all the time, don't we? And sometimes we use it in a way that's not necessarily all that bad. Uh, we can be proud of our children, proud of our work, things like that. And uh, that's not necessarily the pride that we're talking about in the Bible. The pride that we're talking about in the Bible is to really be arrogant and think oneself better than what they are, to look down on other people. And of course, if you've ever been looked down upon by those that are in a position of pride, you know how hurtful that can be and how destructive that can be, not only to the individual that has the pride, but to those to whom that sense of superiority is directed. Uh, gospel preachers, elders, uh, members in general, anybody that tries to stand up and teach the truth and confront error and contend for the faith are, are, are sooner or later going to probably sooner than later, I guess I ought to say, is going to run, against, run up against somebody that has this pride problem. Um, David called me, I think it was Wednesday, about 10 o'clock in the morning, and asked me if I would get this lesson together. <laughs> uh, and I said, yeah, that'd be fine. And so I got my concordance out that night and looked up pride in the New Testament, there's one verse. I said, that's okay, I'll look up proud. Likewise, there's one verse. Now, if we're just going by the amount of verses that have pride and proud uh, specifically mentioned in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, since we're talking about Jesus confronting pride, you would think this would be a very short lesson because, like I said, there's, there's only mentioned twice. But the idea is there over and over and over again. And so we're going to deal with some of the, uh, I guess, secondary matters that are related to pride in this lesson. 
In Matthew chapter 7, and beginning in verse 20, uh, Jesus, of course, is dealing with the accusation that his disciples were in sin because they didn't wash their hands before they ate. And the Pharisees and scribes believed that that would then uh, make them unclean. And these, Jesus responded to that. He says, that which comes out of the man defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. I don't know about you, but pride has some pretty... Uh, rough company that it's keeping if we look at that list there's some things that we would all would agree that are are wrong and bad we ought to abstain from it and right there in the middle of all those things we find the word pride pride is one of those things that will defile a man in fact if, if you really think about it pride is in a, in a large sense is one of the most soul damning things that's listed in the Bible because pride gives rise to other sin. If somebody is, is a prideful person, then that's going to cause them to act in certain ways that are contrary to the will of God and, and therefore lead them into further sin. The Bible talks much about pride. In the Old Testament, the, uh, in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 17, it's listed among those things that God hates, a proud look. Uh, also, in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18, it says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Notice it leads to destruction. It causes us to fall. Fall from where? Fall from God's grace. Fall from, from uh, perfection. Uh, in our, again, in our context, Jesus explained that man is condemned by those things that come out of his mouth, those things that originate from within, from within the heart. And that's where pride originates. We think about pride. Pride is really a heart problem. It is a problem that originates within the man and then comes out through his words and actions. Therefore, we need to guard ourselves and keep our heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. You know, we think about this idea of pride and proud, as we mentioned, are found only two times in the New Testament. Luke 1 and verse 51 uh, has the idea that God has the strength to overthrow the proud. And he does so. And in the same context, it says he exalts the lowly. And so a lot of times when we, we think about the position of people in life and we think how great some people are, well, sometimes we're just looking at it from their standpoint of pride. And then we got another person that's very humble and meek, and we think, well, you know, that's not a very great person. Well, in the scriptures, those ideas really are reversed. The, the great person is one that is meek, that is humble, that is lowly. And that's the one that God's going to exalt. The prideful person, on the other hand, is the one that God will cast down. Now, I'm going to look at this lesson. Since the pride is a problem of the heart, it manifests itself in various ways. And so in this lesson, we're going to co consider some ways in which pride manifests itself. And the first thing we want to talk about is pride and prominence. A prideful person wants to have prominence, and I'm going to make a distinction between prominence and preeminence. Okay? And, and you might think it's, a, it's not much difference, but I believe there is, and so we're going to consider those two things differently. When we think about prominence, we're talking about somebody that exalts himself. That wants to, to think of himself better than other people. That's the kind of person that looks down their nose at others. And we have a, a great example of that in Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 10 and going through verse 14, when we, we study about the, the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. 
And Jesus spoke this parable because there were some Jews who, what? Trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Look at me. I'm all that. I'm good. I'm Abraham's descendant. Right? And this was especially true of the Pharisees who thought they were the great keepers of the law. But Jesus showed them for the hypocrites and frauds that they really were. In fact, in most of the cases when Jesus confronted sin related to pride, you're going to find that it was the scribes and the Pharisees with whom he dealt. And so Jesus tells this parable about two men. A Pharisee, one that the Jewish people would have thought, well, you know, that's the religious leader of our day. They're great. They're wonderful. Uh, and, and, you know, we need to follow them and be like them. And then he contrasted that fellow with a publican. Likewise, most Jews, and probably all of the Jews, would have looked down upon the publican. That's the tax collectors. How many people, coming up on April 15th, how many people like going to the accountant and paying their taxes? Well, if you don't like that, how would you like to have a crooked tax collector come to your door and not only take what you owe, but get extra also to line his pockets? Well, that's the publican. Okay? And that's who Jesus is contrasting this so-called religious leader with. So they go to pray. And uh, as soon as they get in there to pray, the Pharisee starts to brag on himself. He talks about the things that he's done. I, I tithe of all I have. And, and he, he thinks, look, look at all what I'm doing, how great I am. And he starts to inform God of his greatness. Right? And then before he's done, he takes a swipe at the publican. And he says, I thank God I'm not like this guy over here. You know, it's real easy sometimes when, when a person is caught up in pride to make themselves look good by tearing down somebody else. And I know some people in the brotherhood that are very good at that. When they're in sin and you try to confront them with sin, the first thing they want to do is rely on their past history of good works, their past reputation, and start saying things like, well, those people are vile. Those people are liars. Of course, they don't give any examples of how they're vile or how they're liars. They just say that. And if that's not pride talking, I don't know what is. It's really a lot like this guy, this, Phar this Pharisee, saying, I'm glad I'm not like this publican. And if you'll notice, Jesus says, the Pharisee prayed with himself. What does that mean? He prayed with himself. That could mean one of two things. He's trying to disassociate himself with the, the publican. I'm over here by myself, praying by myself. Or it could be that he's praying and nobody's listening. I have the idea that the second was really the case. That he was praying with himself in the sense that God wasn't listening to that prayer. Because he didn't have the right attitude. His heart wasn't right. His motive wasn't right. And so he just prayed with himself. Now the, the publican on the other side, he's over there. And you would think, well, what kind of prayer could this man have? Well, he was, he was so humble. He wouldn't raise up his eyes even to heaven. He smote himself on the breast. And he said, forgive me, for I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, that man went to his house justified. And that's just opposite of what the people would have thought. But such is the nature of pride. Righteousness must exalt that of the scribes and Pharisees. That's what Jesus told the people. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20 he says, If it doesn't, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you think this might be what he had in mind? Because you see, the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees wasn't righteousness at all. It was really self-righteousness. And it was motivated by pride. And there's a lot of our brethren. I'm telling you, if you've dealt with many people over the years and trying to get them to see the error of their ways and, and trying to get, encourage them to repent, you're going to find a lot of people with this self-righteous attitude. And they're not going to be 
uh, responding very well to the honest, sincere, loving efforts to restore them and get them to see the error of their ways. Pride will exalt itself and tradition above God. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. Here's Jesus again confronted by the scribes and the Pharisees. And what do, what do they say? Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of our fathers? And Jesus turned around and, and asked them a question back. Why do you tra transgress the will of God with your traditions? How much pride does it take to put the traditions of men ahead of the will of God? That's really sometimes easy to do, especially when pride is involved. Furthermore, in Matthew chapter 15, the same chapter, verse 14, of those people that, that held traditions higher than the will of God, Jesus said, let them alone. Let them alone. How are we supposed to treat prideful people that exalt themselves? That want prominence? Whether it's with God or men? Let them alone, he says. Why? They're blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall in the ditch. You see, that's where pride goes. Isn't that the verse we just looked at in Proverbs? Pride Leads to what? Destruction. And the haughty spirit leads to what? A fall. If the blind lead the blind, they're both going to fall in the ditch. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, we have the instruction what to do about it. Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Who's the one that gets exalted? The one that exalts himself? No, God's going to cast that person down every time. But if through humility we seek the will of God, then what's going to happen in due time? We will be exalted. But it's not going to be me exalting myself or you exalting yourself. It's going to be God in the right way at the right time, exalting the right people. And that person is the one that exhibits humility. The second thing, pride and preeminence. The first one, people trust in position. This one, I believe, people trust in power. And a New Testament example of that is Diotrephes in John, uh, 3 John, verse 9. He loved to have the preeminence to the extent that he rejected some brethren and even the Apostle John. That's, that's pretty arrogant there, folks. You're going to put your will, your position, your preeminence before the brethren and before an apostle and think you're going to get away with it. This was a huge problem in the first century. Hypocrites like the scribes and the Pharisee, they would pray and fast and, and give their alms to be seen of men. Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, 5, and 16. And Jesus said they have their reward. You know, those are things that we ought to be doing. Some of us need to fast more than others. Maybe I'm one of them. But we need to pray. We need to help the poor. But we don't need it to be done, to be seen of men, so we can get the glory that comes from that. You see, we're, we're glory hogs. No. No. We need to do those things. Let our light so shine before men. And how do we do that? By our good works. By our good works. And who's supposed to get the glory? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. He's the one that's supposed to get the glory. Those things that we ought to be doing anyway should be done to the good and glory of God because we're doing them on His behalf and through our service to Him. Now, if we're only doing them to, to look good before men, to appear pious, or, or to appear, appear better than other people, what did Jesus say? Yeah, they have their reward. The scribes and Pharisees sought greatness. 
Matthew chapter 23, verses 5 and five through 7, he says, All their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the border of their garments and love the upper rooms of the feast and the chief seats in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. That's the things that they sought. And they sought them out of pride. From, a, from the heart, pride comes forth and that's what it ended up with these guys. That's how it manifested itself. And even the disciples of our Lord were not immune from this idea of seeking power and preeminence. In Mark 9 verse 33 and, and verse 34 it says, And he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, What was it that ye disputed among yourselves by the way? But they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. Competition among brethren is never a good thing. We're not here to compete with one another. You know, we have some people that watch these lectureships, and when we were doing those lectures on those heretical books a few year, couple of years ago, did two years on those, and people called in, and they spurned us and talked about how few of us there were and, and how much good works they were doing. It wasn't that from a position of pride that they attacked us like that? W weren't they coming from a position of arrogance? I think it was Lester Camp that they ridiculed because he was preaching at a small congregation. wonder how many people were in the ark and how many people were outside the ark. Now the Bible tells us there was eight people in the ark. I don't know how many thousands or millions were outside. Right? I wonder how many people are going to be on that broad way and how many people are going to be on that narrow way that Jesus talked about. Strive, he says, to enter. Strive, work hard at it. To enter the straight gate. For broad is the way, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Many there be that enter in thereat. And straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there be that find it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. How many people are going to be lost, and how many people are going to What's the ratio of that? I don't know, but I know the difference between few and many. And I do know that just because something is few in number doesn't lessen its value or its greatness in the eyes of God. I do know if we're not everything God says we ought to be, then we're going to be on that broad way and, and, and I know where that ends in destruction. And I'm afraid, friends and brethren, that there's a lot of people that are caught up in this attitude of pride and think that their strength and, 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 and power and glory in numbers are going to be sadly mistaken in the day of judgment. It was brought up in John chapter 6. Somebody heard, overheard somebody talking about it after one of the lessons. Along about verse 60 and verse 66 where Jesus had some hard sayings. And it says in that context that many of the disciples ceased to follow him. And Jesus was so upset about it that he followed after him and said, Now wait a minute, you misunderstood what I had to say. He said, Let me soften up the message so I can keep my followers. Now you see, if Jesus was motivated by pride, those are some of the things that he might have done. Right? But Jesus was motivated by the truth. And by his love for lost souls. And so you know what he really did in that situation? He turned to the twelve. And he asked them, Will you depart also? The point of that in this lesson is this. Jesus was willing to stand by himself. And he wasn't going to compromise the truth in any way. Even if it meant he lost all of his followers. Thankfully though, Peter answered and said, To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. You see, that's the attitude we need to have. 
And if we all had that attitude, if every Christian, any person that came up out of the watery grave of baptism submitted their will to the will of God and sought His greatness rather than their own, the church would be a lot better off. We would have fewer problems in, in, the, in the local congregation or the church worldwide because everybody is submitting to the will of God. Trying to give Him the glory and not themselves. Who is great? Of the Pharisees, Jesus said in Matthew 23 and verse 12, Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. To his disciples, Jesus said, Mark 9 and verse 34, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all. And servant of all. He demonstrated this by washing the feet of the disciples. John 13 verses 4 through 14. That context he said. If then your Lord and Master have washed your feet. Ye ought to wash one another's feet. Think about that. I, I, I remember Peter in this context. He went to wash Peter's feet. Peter says not me. Not me Lord. And Jesus says, you know, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have any part of me. And you know what Peter said? Not my feet only, but all of me. You see, submit to the will of God. Pride. Pride almost got in Peter's way. This idea that some people are better than other people. No. We're all one in Christ. Right? Right? We're all one in Christ. We're all equal where that's concerned. Pride in possessions. Some people trust in their wealth. Pride in possessions. Boast about their accomplishment. Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament. Is a prime example. Daniel chapter 4 verse 30. He said the king spake and said. Is not this great Babylon. That I have built for the house of, of the kingdom. By the might of my power. And for the honor of my majesty. Now wait a minute. If the Israelites had been doing what they were supposed to have done. Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon would never have overthrown God and his people. God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to be in that position. God allowed him to do great things on his behalf. God used Nebuchadnezzar to chastise his people. But notice Nebuchadnezzar. Look what I've done. Look at the consciences I've had. And my majesty. See, he took the glory for himself. That's pride. That's arrogance. And of course, we know the end of that story. God drove him crazy. went out and lived as a beast in the field. Until God brought him back to his right mind. Sometimes I wish that would happen to some of my brethren. But it's probably not going to happen. Unfortunately, God doesn't deal with us directly like that today. And, but in some cases, it would certainly be nice. Man, we don't wish any ill will on anybody, but we do see these kinds of lessons in the Old Testament. I have a New Testament example. Luke chapter 12, verse 16 through 21. The rich fool. The guy, this guy, he was so blessed by the Lord that his crops brought forth so plentifully that he didn't have room in his barn to hold the crops. And so he decides, I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger barns. And notice how many times I'm saying I here. Well, six times in this context he says I. Again, we can see this self-centered man with eye trouble. He says, I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger barns. I'm going to store up my goods. And I'm going to say to my soul, So thou hast much goods stored up for many days. Take thine ease. You know, there's a lot of people that put more emphasis on work and the accumulation of wealth than they do on the church, Christ, and God, right? They're, they're too busy to come to the assembly because oh, I gotta go work. They're too busy to raise their children because I gotta go work. They're too busy to study the Bible because they gotta go work. Why do you have to go to work? So I got more stuff. Why do you need the stuff? 
I don't know, but I want it. And it's a vicious cycle. The more stuff they get, the least, less satisfied they are, so the more stuff they want. Here's the thing, friends and brethren. If you're not satisfied without the stuff, you're never going to be satisfied with the stuff. But this guy was prideful. Look at all I've accomplished. I'm, I'm set for life. And you know that night, God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. Then whose things shall these be which thou hast provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Like Nebuchadnezzar, this guy was selfish, self-centered, prideful. Look at all what I've done. Never once did he acknowledge that God had any, anything to do with it. Never once did he thank God for the blessings that he had received. Never once did it cross his mind that he could share his prosperity with those around him. You see, those are some things that happen when you become prideful and arrogant and think about the accomplishments that you've made. Now, when we go through life, you know, we need to plan for the future. And I'm not saying we shouldn't. But that shouldn't be the sole purpose of our existence, to make sure that we have enough set aside for our old age. We need to recognize that we're put on this earth to worship and serve God. That's what we're here for. And we're to serve not only God, but part of that service is to serve one another. To help one another. To preach the gospel to one another. But those people through pride that want to do nothing except what's beneficial for them. They're not going to help anybody else. They're not going to give God the glory. They're not going to prepare themselves to take the gospel message to the lost. In fact, most people who are prideful to this extent won't even prepare their own soul for the next life. And that's what happened to this rich fool. We must not trust in uncertain riches. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17. Paul tells Timothy, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded. There's that idea of pride. Nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to be enjoyed. I'm not going to get to everything that I have down here, I don't think, but we're going to go as far as we can. Pride and Prejudice. Make a good book title, wouldn't it? <laughs> Somebody write that down and put that in the book title. Pride and Prejudice. Prejudice was a problem in the first century. It really was. And it really was a misunderstanding of the distinction that God made between the Jews and the Gentiles in the Old Testament. Uh, God did make a distinction between them and made regulations between marrying Jews and between Jews and Gentiles, between even trade between Jews and Gentiles. And had laws regulating Gentiles living within the boundaries of the Hebrew nation. Proselyte laws in case somebody wanted to, to become a proselyte. And how to deal with that. There's all kind of regulations regarding the Jew-Gentile relationship. Now this developed over a period of time. And manifested itself during the time of Jesus. Into Jews are better than Gentiles. We're just better than them. In fact, especially loathsome to the Jews were the Samaritans, who were the Hebrew people, the northern kingdom, that intermarried with Gentiles and then became the Samaritan nation. Their offspring became the Samaritan nation. And these half-breeds were no better than dogs. They were not to be tolerated. In fact, in John chapter 4 and verse 9, when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well at Sychar, the Samaritan woman, she was just really astounded. Here you are, a Jew, talking to me, a woman 
who am a Samaritan. We don't have dealings with one another. It was out of place. It was uncommon. But Jesus confronted this idea of prejudice or racism or bigotry. Not only in the form of different between nationalities, but also even gender discrimination because he talked to a woman. Remember, she says, you're, you're a Jew and you're talking to me, a woman who am a Samaritan, right? At one point in John chapter 8 and verse 48, they were trying to slander Jesus. And so they thought about the, what's the worst thing we could say about Jesus to turn the people against him. That's kind of what I think was going on in their mind. And so this is what they come up with. They accused Jesus of being possessed by a devil and being a Samaritan. Kind of reminds me of Jed one time. He was mad. At, he was real little and he was he's angry with his mom. And, and he looked up at her and he says, you, you. And he knew he couldn't say anything bad. And so the worst thing he could come up with to say to her is, you, you woman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where he got that idea. <laughs> okay, but that's, but that's kind of what they did here. This is the worst thing they could say about him. He's a Samaritan. The Canaanite woman with the demon-possessed daughter trying to come to Jesus so that he would heal her, his, her daughter. And the disciples were trying to get Jesus to turn her away. Matthew 15 and verse 23. Send her away, they said. Prejudice is a problem in the church today. Maybe not among the brethren represented here, but we're talking to people across the world through the internet. It's a problem in our society. It's a problem in our schools. It's a problem in the workplace. And it's a problem in the church. I have a book in my library. I may reference it in my next lesson, maybe a little more detail. But it was a preacher that was baptized by Marshall Keeble. And, you know, he, Marshall Keeble was a black man. And this fellow was a black man. His name was Miller. And Brother Miller put together a little booklet with, by being encouraged by the brethren to do so, with some sermons. I have a copy of that book. It's written back in, I think, the 20s. And in the preface of that book, he talks about his conversion. And he talks about his progress and encouragement from other brethren to become a gospel preacher. And he kept saying things like the white brethren and the black brethren and the white churches and the black churches and the white brethren did this to help me and 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 in fact he even held gospel meetings at white churches and even at one time went and preached for a white church is there ever going to be a time when there's just a church of Christ and no white churches and black churches I understand we have a Spanish speaking congregation Right, But the distinction between the Spring Church of Christ and the Ecclesia de Cristo de Spring, my East Texas, my East Texas Spanish accent. But here's the deal. There's a reason to have two congregations meeting under this roof or in the next building. There's a reason for that. And the reason is there's a language barrier. The people need to be taught in their language so they can understand and not be hindered in their, in their understanding and knowledge and growth as a Christian. But there should never be, even though there's language barriers, there should never be, be a color barrier. There should never be a color barrier. I am ashamed to say that there's some of my brethren who I put on the spot and ask specifically, would you preach the gospel to a black person? And they said, no. I don't consider them my brethren. I'm ashamed of those people. 
I've had people say they wouldn't teach the gospel to a homosexual. My first question is, will you teach the gospel to an adulterer? Well, yeah. Well, what's the difference? Sin, sin. See, prejudice. We have prejudice against sin. We have prejudice against gender. We have prejudice against color. And by the way, this idea of I'm one race and somebody else another race, I always thought we was all part of the human race. You know, I know a little bit about biology and animals and things. We had cattle and their bovines. And uh, we had some black ones. We had some white ones. We had some red ones. And we had some brown ones. We even had some yellow ones. But they were all cows. They were all cows. You know, there wasn't one classification set aside. This is one race of cows, the black ones. And this is another race of cows over here, the red ones. And another class, uh, uh, a class of cow, a uh, race of cows over here, the white ones. We don't do that with cows. There's no different races of cows. There's just one classification, and that's bovine. They're all the same. They're just different colors. There's not one race for whites, one race for blacks, one race for brown, one race for yellow, one race for red. God made all men of one blood, Paul said in Acts chapter 17. We're all one. We're all the same. We're all made in His image. By the way, what color is the soul? Does a black man have a black soul and a white man have a white soul? When we get to heaven, is there going to be a heaven for the whites, one for the blacks, one for the, the Mexicans, and one for the Orientals? Is it going to be that way? Of course, we know the answer to that is no. I believe the most insidious manifestation is pride of pride is when one group of people think they're superior to another group of people simply because their skin is a different color. Shame on them. Jesus died for all men. We're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Doesn't specify what color. Disciples are to be made of all nations. Not just one. All that's based on pride. Based on pride. That's my time. Thanks for yours. You know, I'm, I'm so proud of Bruce. I, I think I can rightly be proud of someone that's exceeded my every expectation. <laughs> I recall when we had the um, uh, lectureship on uh, Mormonism, we had some of the uh, some Mormon from the temple over here that came over here, and he was, of course, he's a very nice guy. He was uh, I had a conversation with him, and as well as others had a conversation with him. But we were back in the building in the back having lunch, and he was trying to impress upon me the, uh, I guess, the glorious nature of the Mormon Church, how big it was, you know. Uh, I don't know how many members they had, and of course the Church of Christ, a little small, insignificant group. And I just asked him, said, uh, how many people were on the ark? He said, 12. I said, I think I, I, I think I'm identified a problem here. <laughs> so. But you know, the, uh, if you, you look at at least one of the parties in, in uh, Romans 14 and in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, at least one of the parties uh, had a 
problem with pride and that they sought to elevate themselves uh, to an extent more than what they ought to. And as uh, the Roman letter says in the 12th chapter, verse 3, we ought not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And I think that's uh, a lot of our problems is that we have, we elevate our own sense of self-worth uh, beyond what we ought to and do not have due consideration to our fellow man and, of course, our brothers and sisters in Christ. So if we can keep that in mind, if the church can keep that in mind and look out for the, uh, the spiritual well-being of the other uh, fellow, then I think that it will alleviate a lot of the problems that are in the church today. A good lesson, Bruce. Certainly appreciate that. I always expect a good lesson from you. <laughs>